Yeah, I've spent the last 25 years trying to integrate sustainability, uh, both as a veterinarian and an epidemiologist, and dealing with emerging uh, epidemiology of food and waterborne diseases and zoonotic diseases. The, the conventional approach has been, that I've worked with has been called ecosystem approaches to health, and it's community-based and integrative. Um, lately, that's morphed into something called One World, One Health, and there's some problems with that, and that's what I'm going to address. This report came out in 2015, Connecting Global Priorities, Biodiversity, and Human Health. That's great. Uh, one of the statements, you, you want to ensure that uh, interventions made in the name of biodiversity, health, or others do not compound public health and conservation challenges. It's too late for that, because the interventions we've done for public health, good public health outcomes, terrible environmental outcomes, and vice versa. There's all kinds of uh, conflicts there. And it's in part because all of this stuff is happening at once, right? It's, we're dealing with wicked problems where everything is happening simultaneously and interconnected with everything else. How do we deal with that? Uh, well, let's look at health. Those are my grandkids. Uh, WHO Constitution. Uh, gives a definition of something that sounds like an orgasm, you know, complete physical, mental, and social well-being. That's great. You got a few seconds of that. Enjoy it. I'm not sure it's sustainable. Um, Rene Dubo, the well-known uh, uh, microbiologist, basically said, a movis vivendi, uh, enabling imperfect people to achieve a rewarding and not too painful existence while they cope with an imperfect world. To me, that's a more workable one. Um, and I, I, I break it down into three Fs. Um, food, friends, and freedom from disease. I'm gonna focus on the food because uh, it's one of the major drivers for emerging diseases like avian influenza and SARS and Ebola virus and various other things. Um, a, a recent uh, publications, a whole range of them, have said, how on earth can we feed seven billion, eight billion, nine billion people, depends on the publication. Um, the first question is, of course, who are we and who are these nine billion people out there? And I'll come back to that. Um, from inside the lab and the cafeteria or the food kitchen, you have this image of nine billion mouths waiting to be fed by somebody. I don't know, Monsanto, McDonald's, uh, World Bank, somebody. Um, inside academia, we have this, this model, which looks complex, but it's really just a bunch of lines connecting things that are connected. Uh, and in the middle, we have this one world, one health, right? And I'm off to a meeting in London in a week and a half on how Ebola fits into this and emerging diseases. But there's this image of this one world, and we're going to have one health for it. Um, let's look at food and how this fits into that. Well, if food equals chickens, and we go back to Henry IV in France, if God keeps me, I will make sure that no peasant in my realm will lack the means to have a chicken in a pot every Sunday. And of course, this has been repeated by politicians every every century. So we want a chicken in every pot, right? Food exports. So we get a chicken in every pot. I'll come back to how we solve that problem because that's directly relevant to my, to my point. Food exports, we've got happy consumers because we've got all these chickens in all the pots. Happy consumers, happy farmers. Uh, we need some inputs if we're going to go to economies of scale, which is how we achieve this, right? So we've got feed. We've got Peruvian fish meal and Brazilian soil. Well, there's some unintended consequences down there. We need water inputs. Uh, it depends on how big the farm is, how big those water inputs are. We've got some outputs. We've got offal, uh, dead stock. We've got manure. On a livestock scale, the, the global livestock output of shit is now about 14 billion tons a year. Um, of livestock um, excrement production. That's an unintended consequence. Um, and we have uh, energy inputs, labor, fossil fuel technology, all necessary to run to get this chicken in every pot. And then we have ecological change, whether it's local ecological changes, landscape changes in Brazil, uh, oceans off the coast of Peru, climate change, weather changes, however one defines those. But the fact that there are these changes is, is not in dispute. And then we have unstable weather patterns. Layered within that, we have changes in the weather, drought, floods, rapid snow melts, 
you get rapid snow melts in Canada and the water comes down from the mountains into the Fraser Valley where the big chicken farms are, it washes through the chicken farms and then the manure ends up in the water and the dead stock ends up in the water. And that's problematic because in the meantime, we've had 10 years of a conservative government which has basically deregulated just about all the industries, right? But when we've got all this stuff in the water, the consumers are suddenly not very happy. Well, it, it didn't happen overnight, but it happened because of some decisions which were the consequences of the kind of society we thought we wanted. Um, and part of the problem with this one world, one health is that we end up with these globally defined problems. We have nine billion people. How are we going to feed those nine billion people? We end up with global solutions. What are those? They're almost all tied to economies of scale. You want to bring down the price of a chicken. You produce lots of chickens in one place. You bring down the price. Even poor people can get a chicken in every pot. That's a good thing, right? The problem is that that's also then tied to the economies of pillage, basically. You're pillaging off the coast of Peru and Brazil and, and landscapes around the world to produce these arguably good outcomes, right? The, the problem is, as I've done work on, on avian influenza, there's no generic chicken, just as there's no generic health. We each have different malleable ideas of what we mean by health. And when I've gone around the world, I mean, you've got mass production chickens. If you look at the lower right-hand corner, those are competitive singing roosters um, from uh, Java. The ones in the middle are competitive uh, fighting roosters, which is actually the origin of our tame chickens uh, that we have in the barns here. They were originally bred in Southeast Asia from wild jungle fowl for fighting. And then they were moved to India and to Europe as, as augers. They cut them open, the guts, and they looked at the, how the guts fell on the, on, the, on the floor, and they said, well, you know, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. It's only since about 1945, 50 that they've become sort of the poor man's food, and that's because we were able to synthesize vitamin D so we could bring them into the lab. So it's directly tied to Cartesian science and economies of scale. So what have we learned? Well, you would think we would learn some lessons about that system and how it's structured. In the last year, I've been looking very intensively at human-insect relationships, not just the disease relationships, but the landscapes and as food, right? So apparently Henry IV 2.0 is insects are going to be the new kale, the new chicken, the new something that's going to save the world in terms of food security. FAO has these conferences, Wageningen has a big research group. It's a global phenomenon. Uh, an FAO report 2014, uh, the feed industry leaders gathered with a clear message. Insects for feed and food are a viable solution for protein deficit problem, and they're talking globally. But this globally defined problem, food shortages, protein shortages, what are we going to do? We're going to eat crickets, we're going to eat mealworms, we're going to eat Okay, I mean, they're, they're good they're, in terms of protein, in terms of fat, it's all good. It's the way that problem is defined and the solutions are therefore devised based on that. The challenge for policy is not so much the technical parts of science, it's how our values direct the scientists to do their work. So if you look at livestock or insects or soybeans, it was when I went through university, soybeans were gonna save the world. Uh, the GMOs, crickets, um, they're either the sources of the world's worst environmental problems, the best solution to protein insufficiency, the best choice for food to help children learn. If you give them protein supplements, they do better in school. That the, the, the evidence is really good there. It's a way out of poverty for women, especially chicken and crickets and so on. They can start at a small scale. It's a way to reinforce gender inequity because what happens is if you commercialize small-scale chicken farming or cricket farming, the men take over because it's moved into the commercial marketplace and the women are stuck at home with what's going to be the next international development project that's going to bring us out of poverty. Um, it's a way to reinforce the power of multinational chemical agro industries. There are these large companies that say, and I've heard the, the CEO of McDonald's say, we know how to feed the world. Let the politicians get out of the way and we can do it, right? And in a sense, they can if you take that sort of mechanistic global view. Uh, it's also a way to solve social problems with neutral agricultural technology. So what we've done is there are two sets of problems here. One is you want to be able to produce lots of chicken. We know how to do that. The other is a social problem. If you produce chickens and crickets and 
other things, in a sustainable fashion, the price goes up. Right? So the problem is poor people can't afford to eat that. One solution would be to have uh, a wealth distribution. It's a social solution to a social problem, right? So we're going to have redistribution of wealth, the social welfare state, those kinds of things. Uh, we don't have politicians that like that, so what we do is we go to economies of scale, which have all of these other consequences. I'm not saying redistribution of wealth doesn't have its own consequences, but the consequences that we're concerned with, we have multiple... That's, that's my thing, okay. Multiple outcomes desired by different actors with different perspectives at multiple spatial and temporal scales related in webs of uncertainty, drawing on different kinds of evidence with different measures of quality. We can't avoid conflicts. So for me, the overriding question is, from a policy point of view, can we create spaces and regulate them to have high quality conflicts? where the actors with conflicting goals working at different temporal spatial scales are mutually respectful and where outcomes and processes will need to be continually renegotiated. To me, that's the way we deal with the scientific technical problems. We create a, a space where we can have good conflicts because the conflicts aren't going to go away. Thank you.